Praise the Lord. Good to be in the house of God tonight and appreciate all of you that are tuning in online and trust that God will minister to you tonight. Psalm 68, if you have your Bible, you can turn there. We're going to look at a verse there that's very uh, uh, one of my favorite verses of uh, the Bible ever since I've uh, uh, been uh, saved and known the Lord. Uh, I did not uh, grow up in a Christian uh, household kind of a normal family, I guess. Uh, uh, my dad was 19, my mom 21 when they got married, and I think it uh, might have been a kind of hurry up and get married. They got married in February. I was born in June, and I wasn't born early. Amen. And uh, just trying to make it right, but unfortunately, uh, they didn't have uh, Christ in their lives. My father, he had come, uh, he lost both parents when he was very young, and uh, things very quickly begin to unravel as alcohol began to get a hold of his life. And uh, I think my mom was a little ornery, knew how to push those buttons. Uh, and then, of course, I came along, and uh, I don't think I helped things too much. I read that little uh, cartoon, Calvin and Hobbes. How many have ever seen that? Uh, I don't know. That might have been based on my life a little bit. You know, I remember uh, uh, my mom tells a story. I don't actually remember this in my mind, but you know, they're a young couple. They've uh, scrounged together and they bought a brand new couch finally, right? They bring that couch home. My mom says uh, she had to run a couple errands. My dad had come home from work uh, and uh, I'm about three years old, or right around two or three years old at the time. Uh, and uh, I guess he fell asleep or something. And so I was just milling about the house, and I found a, a can of cocoa, uh, you know, a cocoa that you, you cook with, and I guess it was a light-colored couch, and so I sprinkled the cocoa and began to make designs, uh, totally destroyed the couch. We didn't even have it 24 hours, and of course, uh, I guess my mom and dad had a bit of a conversation, if you want to call it that, when she got home, and uh, I didn't always help things. You know, we had a little uh, Volkswagen uh, bug, one of those beetle bugs, uh, and uh, you know, I'm just a kid out and around the house milling about the yard. And we had one of those garages that you didn't park a car in. It was full of stuff. And I'd go back in there and climb around and hunt around. And I found some 16-penny nails. And I was just curious, my little mind, I wonder if this would work. So I took uh, 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 some 16-penny nails and I put them all around all four tires, three each uh, of our car, and thought, you know, we're going to back out this way, so I'll put the nails like that, and I set them there, and off I went on to other things. I totally forgot about it. I guess it was probably later that day. Uh, we had to give my dad a ride to work. You know, we only had one car. I'm sitting in the back seat. Uh, totally forgot about that project. I had moved on to other things. And uh, all of a sudden, the car stopped, and my dad started yelling, and, uh, you know, he gets out, and, you know, I think three of the tires had went totally flat by that point, and, you know, he looked at the tires, and there's three perfectly lined up penny nails on every tire, uh, you know, uh, I, all I do is I remember my mom looking in the back seat saying, don't say a word, probably trying to save my life at that moment. As my dad was uh, a steel worker, he was on the way to work, and being late to work was frowned on, and that was, uh, that was a bad day. Uh, sometime later, my the neighbors were painting the house, and I would go over, and I'd watch the painters doing their thing, and, you know, like a little kid asking a gazillion questions. And I remember when I was in the garage, I saw an old can of paint. And so uh, we had a two-story house. It's aluminum siding house. It was kind of a grayish, off-white aluminum siding. And I, I found this paint. It was so old, like the, the top of it had crusted over. It was hard. No problem, I found a screwdriver, <laughs> and I, you know, it was all thick and, you know, like gluish, but I just started stirring, man. I, I mean, I whipped myself up to a sweat. I found an old uh, paintbrush that was totally stiff, but I got it in there and started working, and so I went around to the side of the house, uh, this ugly green, I don't even know how to explain it, uh, I just kind of scooped it up in there and walked down the side of the house. Uh, I, I think I might have been, this was probably around 1967, I might have been one of the original 
taggers. I never got to the level where I painted on the side of trains and stuff, but I did a pretty good job on the house. I guess it might have been a mistake to paint my initials almost as big as my body several times down the house as I was learning how to do my name. I just practiced with that big old, and this was not, you know, water-based paint. This was once it's on there, on there paint. And, but not to be caught. I took the paint can back in the garage, and you know, it had a dust circle there. It had been sitting there forever. I mean, I set it in that thing perfect. It looked like it had never even been moved. I threw the paintbrush back into somewhere. It probably still hasn't been discovered till this day. You know, it's going to be like the, uh, uh, like the pyramid. Someday they're going to go in the garage and discover this uh, stuff. Uh, and I'm thinking, okay, and again... Uh, It was on the side of the house we didn't see real often when we would pull down the driveway or down the road. Well, one day we had went to uh, Grandma's house, and we came home the back way. And again, I totally forgot about that. I've done all kinds of other things since that project. When all of a sudden my mother began to yell my name and in a tone that's, you know, like it's like the the death yell, like you're going to die right now type of yell. And I look up and there it is on the side of the house. And uh, that wasn't a good day for me. You know, the Bible says your sin will find you out. You know, the Bible says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned. We're born sinners. And, you know, these are cute little stories, but, you know, part of me is curious about about that. You know, why so destructive? I remember melting little army men on the light bulbs and the house stinking up like, you know, melted uh, uh, wax and things. And there are many other things that I I got into. And, uh, you know, the home life, uh, for a while there was okay, but then things begin to escalate between mom and dad. Till finally it culminated one night with the police surrounding the house. It was a barricade situation. And without going into all the details, I still remember sitting on the bed. Uh, it's kind of dark. I can see the flashing lights on the window of the house. I can hear the bullhorn from the police talking to my dad. I can still remember seeing the silhouette of my dad sitting on the edge of the bed holding a shotgun, uh, deciding what he was going to do in this moment. Thankfully, it ended peacefully. I remember riding in the police car to Grandma and Grandpa's that night, uh, and a short time later, my dad drove down the driveway and never came home again. My dad, re, or my mom remarried. That kind of fell apart after a while, and uh, to start over, we moved from Ohio, where I was, out to Tucson, Arizona. And uh, I was probably right around 11, 12 at that time, 1975-ish. And uh, so, you know, that's a time you, you leave all your friends. I'm going to a totally different place. And we moved to the south side of Tucson. And for those that ain't familiar, uh, that's where all the lowriders are. And, uh, you know, what, the town I was from, it was pretty much, you know, you had black and white. But when I went to Tucson, there was this other in-between color, brown, the Mexicans. And I was the only white boy on the street. And that was made clear to me often. You know how you're, you're just walking, man, you're just minding your own business. I ain't looking at nobody. I ain't saying nothing. And all of a sudden, hey, man, what are you looking at? I'm like, man, I ain't looking at nothing, you know. It's going to be a fight. Well, sometimes you win, sometimes you don't. One time I got in a fight, and I was actually winning. I was so happy. I'm winning. I'm winning, you know. I was got in a fight with a a guy named Tony Mendeblis. The problem is Tony had four brothers. You know what ticked me off about that? They used to beat him up. You know, later on, Tony and I became friends. I'm like, man, you guys beat him up all the time. Why couldn't you let me do it that day? But it's because it's familiar. You know, you can't, can't do that. In fact... Because my home was all jacked up, my mom had, you know, the boyfriends and things, I almost lived at Tony's house. I didn't know any Spanish. They taught me words, none of which I can say in church tonight. I remember them telling me, go up to that girl and say this, what's that mean? You're beautiful. So, you know, for a few times they got me there, I'd go up and say whatever it was and get slapped or, you know, uh, hit or something like that. 
And, you know, they'd tell me later what it was. And I'm like, man, you know. But I remember B, I, I was there all the time. And, uh, you know, again, I didn't understand all the conversation. I began to catch up with it as time went on. But the, one day, Tata was there. He came over from Sonora. And we're sitting there, and they're all talking. And uh, he's got this jar of some green beans. And, uh, you know, he's offering people some of these green beans. But, you know, raw green beans, when they're not cooked, I don't know why he's doing that. And they're all, no, 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 no. But me to be silly, you know, to be funny, hey, I'll, I'll eat one. And the whole room stops. And he, he offers the thing. Now, I'm 12 years old. So I reach in and I grab a couple green beans. They're a little small, but whatever. I pop them in. They're not green beans. They're Serrano chilies. <laughs> I'm on fire. Ah! I mean, I spit it out right on the kitchen floor, but, or the living room floor, but don't worry, it was all tile in the house. And anytime you walked in the house, anytime today I smell Lysol, I think I'm at Tony's house. These people, they, they, they do Lysol, and they sweep the dirt yard. Have you ever seen that? Never seen that before in my life. They actually will sweep the dirt yard. It looks like a floor out in the front, but it's just dirt. Anyway, I'm in there, and I'm on fire. I don't know. I mean, I can't breathe, man. This is bad. And so I run into the kitchen. I grab a gallon of milk, rip the top, and just start chugging. I don't want a glass. And it felt so good. Ah. But, you know, eventually you need air or get full, so I'd stop and whoosh, it'd get hot again. I'd, ah! And they said, okay. I said, man, it ain't funny. I can't breathe. I mean, I, I'm about ready need to go to the hospital. They said, here, here, here. They dump a pile of salt in my hand and say, that'll neutralize it. Put that in your mouth. Friend, I don't care. They could have put whatever in my hand. I want to put the fire out so the whole mound of salt goes into my mouth. Well, I found out later, salt doesn't neutralize it. It intensifies it. So I spit it out, and they're laughing. You know, please don't be offended, but can I ask a question? What is it about Mexicans that seeing other people get hurt, they find funny? I'm not kidding. One day, my friend Tony, we, we took a pole out of the ground, a chain-link pole. It's got a chunk of cement at the end of it. He throws it down, but it whips around, and I mean just about splits his head open. I kind of went, <gasps> but his brothers, ah, I, I mean, they thought it was, I, just, I don't get it to this day, man. I don't know what that is. That's kind of weird. It's just like they crack up. So they're all, they're in tears, man. Here's this little white boy on fire. I mean, I'm turning red as can be. I can't breathe. And they get me to do this stuff. And finally, I'm like, this is not funny. I get out in the yard, and they're like, okay, man. I go, what do I do? What do I do? I can't breathe. They say, you know what? I promise you to take some grass. Now, come on, man. I'm like, no. Now, I'm not crazy about the grass because they got like five dogs running around the yard. But they said, no, man, I promise. Now, they did this thing. I'm like, now, if you do that, you got to tell the truth or you're going to hell, right? They had something about that. Every time we passed a Catholic church, they would, they would, you know, their sinners is all get out. But you get around the church and we, you know, respect and all that stuff. So when they did that, I thought, okay, they're telling the truth. And friend, I'm desperate. I reach down, roots and all. I got a wad of grass in my hand. I got roots hanging out of my mouth. They bust up laughing. They can't breathe anymore. They're on the. They're so hysterical. I'm like, man, it's not funny. I got dirt coming out of my mouth. Finally went home, and after a time of trying all kinds of different things. Now these are funny stories, but the reason I share that with you, you know, why? Why would I do that? What was that all about? Why would I hang out with people I can even hardly understand? I mean, I could understand my friends, but, you know, their mom and everybody else pretty much just spoke Spanish. And it was because, as jacked up as they were, they were a family. I didn't have that. And I felt just a little bit like I had a family when I was there. And... Uh, I begin to think about that because this is a very deep need in human nature. And those are innocent stories, and I'd love to tell you they stayed that way, but unfortunately my friends also 
were involved other things, and I'm not going to belabor all these details, but that's also where I had my first experience with drugs, alcohol, and many other things that quickly degenerated. And uh, the little boy paint on the thing became much darker, much evil, uh, much more intense things. And I found myself spiraling out of control, getting kicked out of high school's programs, uh, uh, involved in spiritualism, witchcraft. The Bible says he who sins is a slave of sin. I didn't necessarily want to do these things. I didn't want to become this way. But it got it got its hooks in me. I remember sitting there when I finally stepped out and began to do drugs. I'm 12 years old, 12 years old. And I'm seeing one of the older brothers in the corner. He had just taken some heroin. He's totally out of it. And I remember at 12 years old, I literally said it out loud, you know, I'll do some drugs and stuff, but I got control of it. I'll never end up like him. Think about that. 12-year-old kid thinking, I got this. And that's how sin jacks us up, is we think we're smarter. We think, yeah, I know it happens to everybody else, but not me. But sadly, we know the story. It often does happen that way. And I found myself really uh, desperate, hurting. I'm not going to say there was never pleasure in sin. There were times I got high, got drunk. I had a great time. But the Bible says it never doesn't, the Bible never says there's no pleasure in sin. It says, in fact, there is for a season. Just enough to get you in. Just enough to sucker you in, to get its hooks into you, and then it flips and it begins to destroy you. And I found myself crying out to God one day and uh, just sitting in my room. I don't even know why. I just had God on my brain. I, I always thought there was a God out there. I was just very skeptical when it came to the church. And I said, God, if you're really real, show me. In fact, it was about 29 years ago, or 30, yeah, 29, 39 years ago, this month, November actually, a man was up on a mountain. He was preaching, and I, I didn't know what he was doing. I couldn't even hear him. I went up to kind of check it out. Long story short, he witnessed to me. He said God had told him to go up there. He, he fought God for a couple days, but he finally went up there, and there I was, and uh, ended up going to a church, seeing a concert. I actually even said a little prayer, but I, you know, I was kind of like, oh, I don't know, man, this, is, this church stuff. I mean, I believe in God and everything, but these people, man, it's, what's, what is this? It was very different, different than anything I'd ever experienced. And so it's like, I want a God, but I wasn't sure about these people. And I could tell there was something powerful going on there. And I just, I, I didn't know for sure. And I eventually told him, you know what, man, nah, I can't do that. I still want to party, the girls and all that. And I lasted about two months until finally God got a hold of my heart. In January of 1982, I gave my life to Christ Went to church a few days later, got uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit, began to speak in tongues, a language I'd never learned, a very supernatural experience. A few days after that, I got baptized February 14th, 1982, and Jesus has been my first love ever since. And uh, it's just a, a wonderful thing, but the verse in the Bible I want to share with you that I believe is a need in every human heart. Psalm 68 verse 5 says, God is a father of the fatherless, a defender of widows. He sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. You know, the statistics say I should be dead, in prison, heroin addict, fill in the blank. And that's exactly where I was going if I would have made it very far at all. But Jesus came into my life and totally flipped that around. I have five children today. I've been married going on 40 years or 38 years, uh, 39 years, whatever it is. I got five children, one grandchild. We just had our first grandchild in July. What, a, what an amazing thing that is. And I just begin to think about the heritage of the Lord. I begin to think about 
right in the midst of a messed up world. And I know it's messed up today, but they said the same thing then, back in the 80s, back in the 60s, back in the 30s. Why would you want to have kids in a messed up world like this? Because God can change them. He can bring a positive influence through them. When God gets a hold of someone's life and they decide, you know what, I really want to know who God is I want to have Jesus in my life. I'm not talking about a program or churchianity or just some kind of religious ritual. I'm talking about a relationship with the creator of heaven and earth. And God wants you to have that tonight. I want to tell one more story. And I wanted to tag this on because this is after I got saved. After I gave my life to Jesus. You know, for a lot of people today, church... There's people that my home would seem fairly innocent compared to what some people go through. The horrific environment that they have grown up in. The horrific conditions. And family is almost non-existent these days. It's just been decimated. And it's not just here in America. It's everywhere in the world. And so here I come, you know, long-haired freak, dope-smoking culture, witchcraft. I come in, I get saved, praise the Lord, you accepted Jesus, here's your Father in heaven, and okay, but he's invisible. A father, what's that? Is that someone who leaves at you? Is that someone who yells at you when you don't do right? Because that's all I knew. And, you know, I got delivered from many things. I want to share this for those, maybe you've given your life to Christ in the last months or a couple years, and you've realized that, you know, just because you pray and you give your life to Jesus, you might not be totally perfect yet. And I got news for you. You won't be in this life. Oh, you'll be changed. You'll get better as you go, but you're never going to get to that day where everything is a okay It just doesn't happen here. I had given up the girlfriend, given up the drugs, uh, you know, got a job, began to pay bills. The darndest thing, though, I had this habit, nicotine. Isn't that crazy? I quit the cocaine, quit the LSD, quit the marijuana, quit all the stuff that I was doing. But for some reason, I, w I just couldn't shake the cigarettes. You know, I'd, do, I'd go the, like the day or two days, I'd rip up, I'm, in Jesus' name, I'd you know, throw them in the trash can. Three hours later, I'm digging them out. The problem is I was pretty good with zigzags too, so I could roll my own and just get so defeated. You know, I saw people come into church that smoke two packs a day, get instantly delivered. What's wrong with me? How come I can't quit? I've prayed, I've quoted the verses, I've heard the sermons that you know, basically said, you know, if you really love God, you'd quit. Do I not love God? And I remember nine months this is going on. I'm witnessing to people. I'm preaching. I'm involved. But then I'd light up a smoke. Then I got sneaky about it, and that's a whole other thing, right? Living this, what seems like, just under condemnation. I'm coming to church, but I've got these things hanging on me. And I came to prayer one day, and I just sat there. I was just condemned. I couldn't even pray out loud. I almost felt like God ain't even going to hear me. I'm a hypocrite, blah, 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 blah. Now the truth is I'm ignorant. I don't really understand things, but that devil takes advantage of that. And self-pity is probably there as well. And I'll never forget it. I'm in prayer, and I'm just sitting there. And I'm consciously deciding, you know, I just can't do it. I'm just not like these people. I'm too broken. And I was just going to get up, quietly walk out. I'm not going to make a scene. I'm just going to leave and not come back. I just, I guess I just can't be a Christian. And all of a sudden, God gave me a vision. And in my mind's eye, I see a father and he's walking with a toddler. You know how toddlers are? You know, especially when they first start walking, they climb up on the couch and they look at the coffee table. Right? And you're like, go for it, go for it. And they do this. And yay! 
It's kind of like that. So the little baby is holding on to dad's pinky. Dad would pray, and he's walking back and forth. And the little baby's there. And every once in a while, the little baby would just, bam, right on his bottom. You know, like babies do. And the father wouldn't even really even say. He'd just kind of bend over, pick him up. And this happened several times. I'm just watching this. When suddenly the little boy falls again, but this time, The father stopped, and his countenance changed. He got angry. He got mean, almost like a monster. Began to yell at the child, What's wrong with you? And very forcibly and violently picked up the baby by the back of the shirt, stormed over to a big, huge trash can, opened the lid, and head first just slammed the baby in the trash can and slammed the lid. It was so violent, so jarring. I remember I, I opened my eyes and I, I immediately said, God, how can you say that? And God said, no, son. How can you say that? That's what you think I am. You think because you fall down, that's how I react. You know, that bothers me more than the habit itself. That you would have this view of who I am. You don't understand. You could fall a thousand times, and I'll pick you up every single one of them. And I just broke. I realized God was going to love me no matter what I did. And I made a vow to God that day. I said, God, because your son went all the way for me, if I fall a thousand times, I promise I will get back up and I will keep going. I won't quit by the grace of God. So far, I'm still here. And I want to tell you that because I believe there might be people here especially church kids. You live under this condemnation of living up to this level that if you don't meet all these things, you're a failure. You're second class. You're living under a cloud of condemnation. Now, this isn't an excuse to say, well, then it don't matter. I'll just go out and get stoned or have sex. But I think you know that's not what I'm saying. God's going to love you no matter what you do. And you've got to realize, you've got to put aside your self-pity, your pride. You've got to really get to know who he is. And did you realize that this took place as I was in prayer? Even though I felt not powerful, I felt like I didn't know, but I went anyway. And that's where God met me. And he keeps meeting me there. And he keeps speaking to me. And I know him much better today than I did then, and I'm more excited about it now than I was back then. And I just want to share that story that, uh, you know, sometimes, I'm not saying you believe this, but sometimes you see a guy get up in a tie, preach a sermon, and we tend to elevate things in our mind like, yeah, but they're different. I'm not. I'm just like you. Maybe not exactly like you, but... uh, just like you, made up of the same stuff. But I've just made a choice that I'm going to do his will, serve him, and the day is coming. You know, one of the things about heaven, did you know this? The Bible says we receive a new body. Now, a lot of times we instantly think, oh, okay, I'm going to look all fit and trim. And that probably will be true because The effects of sin and all of that will be removed. But see, the real blessing isn't that you look all fit and trim. The real blessing is that nature in you that fights God, that nature in you that hates the things of God, that just resists it every step of the way, won't be there anymore. Now you'll have a body. Not only will your spirit want to live for God, but your body will as well. Friend, that's going to be the blessing of when Jesus comes. Praise the Lord. I can shed this tent and get me a new one that's not a fallen nature. Hallelujah. Hasn't been corrupted by sin. We shall put on an incorruptibility like Jesus. That is the hope of salvation. Heaven's going to be an amazing thing. And I just felt to encourage those that are here, those that are online, maybe you don't know Jesus tonight. I'm not talking about a program. 
I'm talking about a loving God who loves you just the way you are. doesn't matter what you're involved in, what you're into tonight. I would pray that you would hear his voice like I did. I often got curious. You know, what caused me? I hadn't been witnessed to. No one had talked to me. I'm just in my room one day going, God, are you out there? God has an ability to speak to us in a thousand different ways. But you know, he sent a Christian. He didn't send an angel. He didn't send some kind of weird cosmic. He sent another person who knew Christ to bring me the answer I needed. That's how God does it. That wasn't an accident. That wasn't just, oh, check that out. I just happened to pray, and this guy's up on a mountaintop. No, God told him, I want you to go up there. And I think it might have been because there I was, crying out to God. That's how he does it. I'd like you to bow your heads with me tonight. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I want to tell you, friend, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him, it's really not difficult. It's a choice. Would not perish. But that word believe isn't just a mental ascent. It means that you're going to give your life to Him. You believe in the way that, okay, God, I don't want to keep living in my sin. I don't want to live the way I've been living. I want to begin to live for You, to know who You are. And I begin to discover that the more I came to church. And I wonder, is there anyone here tonight, you're not saved, you're not right with God, but God is talking to you. You feel the love of God tonight. He's not going to force his way in. He's going to knock gently. He's going to speak to you, that soft, still voice. It's a spirit voice. It's not something you hear audibly. It's something you hear in your spirit. And if you'll listen, he'll be talking to you right now. How many would say, Pastor, he's talking to me. I want to say yes. I want to give my life to Christ right now. You slip up your hand all over this place. You're online. You can even lift your hand right where you're at. Say yes yes to Jesus. I'm unsaved. I'm backslidden. I want to give my heart to God tonight. I want Jesus in my life. I want to have that personal relationship. I want to know my sins are forgiven, that I can go to heaven. You slip up your hand. Quickly, I'm going to change the call tonight. Maybe you're online and you're ready to give your life. You're just clicking along. Someone shared a link. I want to tell you, I don't believe it's an accident. I believe God wants to speak to you right now, and you would pray this prayer. Father in heaven, I believe in Jesus. I believe you died for my sins, that you rose again from the dead. Please forgive me for all my sins. I give my heart to you. Come into my life. I want to follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, there would be some instructions there for you. Fill that out so we can pray for you, help you in your walk with God. There might be others here. You know we live in a time, it's crazy right now. I also want to encourage you. You know, everyone here has got a testimony. Testimonies are powerful, aren't they? Not so much that, you know, all the horrific things, but the testimony isn't what we were, it's what God has done. That's what makes the testimony powerful. I tell my kids, you know, we sometimes hear people like Roman Gutierrez who makes my life look like kitty land. He was involved in some very bad things, you know, and yet he got saved and God powerfully changed his life. And sometimes we tend to think if we're not involved in really terrible, bad sin, church kids especially, they don't have a testimony. But I try to remind them, who has the best testimony of all mankind? Jesus, who did not sin once. See, your testimony isn't that you were into all this crazy stuff, but now you're a Christian. Your testimony is who you are in Christ. And if you'll just share that with people, it's very powerful. We're going to stand. Maybe God spoke to you. You want to find a place to pray, you can do that. But we're going to take a moment to worship God and just allow God to minister. Is there anybody here tonight, you have pain or you're sick in your body, just lift your hand right where you're standing. I have pain or sickness. Good. Amen. That means we're some healthy people. We got a couple here. And uh, do you have pain in your body? Where's the pain, dear? In your back? Where's, do you have pain or are you just... 
okay, but you're praying for a sick thing. We're going to believe God for these. If you're watching online, I want you to lay your hand on your body as close as you can where that pain is. I want you to say this prayer right now. In the name of Jesus, I cast out all pain, all sickness. I cast out all bitterness, all rejection, all fear, all self-pity. The blood of Jesus sets me free. All pain, all sickness must go right now in Jesus' name. Let's begin to worship God and praise Him. In the name of Jesus, I command pain to go. I command healing right now. In Jesus' name. All right, begin to check yourself. If you have pain, move a little bit. Uh, if you're online and you get a miracle, please make sure there's an email there. Please uh, send in a short testimony. Uh, you are watching on such and such a day. Uh, let us know what is happening. And we don't even need to share your name unless you give permission. We'd use maybe a first name uh, just to give God the glory. Sis, how are you doing? Is it still there? Is it gone? Feels better? Okay, so it might be going away. Father, I just pray a complete healing right now. The pain that has begun to go will go completely. I believe you for a complete healing. Loose her right now in Jesus' name. Let's praise God one more time. Amen. These are, uh, these are uh, tricky times with this whole COVID thing. It vexes my soul. But you know what, church? We'll get past it. I'm believing by next year. I mean, Tucson, we're, we're in full mode building our new building for our conference coming up. Uh, I think it's going to time uh, this coming year. I'm, I'm going to be talking more about it this week. Uh, but we're going to kick into a high gear and begin to see God do some incredible things. Uh, and I'm looking forward to that. But God's not done with us. Amen. Man, he's stirring me. I got some uh, messages in the quiver for these last few services that I will be, uh, really believe will be an encouragement. But I just felt to share this uh, here. I shared my testimony. I shared different bits and pieces. Last time here, I think, was seven years ago. So I felt liberty to maybe share that again. But I also want to remind you, you know, your testimony. I mean, it's good if you quote Scripture, and that's great. But if you just take time to tell people just what God's done in your life, just in your own way, I'll tell you, it's very powerful. God will anoint that. And he will use that to touch other people for Christ. You believe that tonight? Let's sing that song again as we wait on the Lord. Pastor will be coming to dismiss us as we worship God.